during Christmas, Vanessa creates a problem for me every year, which is that she bakes a lot of cookies. And the, the problem is that I don't, I don't have the ability to stop. She makes, uh, she makes amazing homemade from scratch chocolate chip cookies. And then this year she made my second favorite cookie of all time, which is a molasses cookie. And if you've never had a molasses cookie, I'm very sorry that you have lived a sheltered, sad life. Um, they're, they're tremendous. Uh, but I, 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 like I have real problems. I, I can't stop eating them. It doesn't matter how many I eat, I'm never full. Uh, it just, I can eat them forever. And uh, the problem, as you, <laughs> as you would imagine, is that that means that eventually that becomes a very bad thing for me, right? If you eat one cookie, that's not a big deal. If you eat a couple cookies, that's maybe not a big deal. If you do what I do and you take stacks of them at a time and follow that up with another stack at a later time, same day, not great. I have no ability to feel content eating cookies. None. It doesn't exist. Uh, the problem is that contentment is a really big deal when we talk about health, right? So if we talk about physical health, contentment makes sense in terms of like eating cookies or eating carbs or whatever it might be. Uh, every Sunday morning, there's, uh, for our team that serves on Sunday morning, we get an order of yummy donuts, uh, which also, if you've never had yummy donuts, I also apologize that you have lived such a sheltered life. Uh, they're incredible. Um, they are, in fact, yummy. Uh, and we have them out there every week. And uh, I, I, I never eat as many as I want to eat, you know, like kind of that thing. I eat one and then I'm like, man, I want another one. And if my kids haven't rated it too much by then, then maybe I'll take another one. And then after the second one, I'm like, oh my gosh, I want so many more. I don't, I just, I don't, but I want them. I have no ability to be contented, but, but contentment is a big deal when we talk about health. And last week we kicked off a series called Get Healthy. And in the first part of the series, we, I kind of laid a foundation for it. So if you missed last week, uh, I'm going to summarize it really quickly, but uh, it's a great message to go back and listen to online. Although as my friend Chris so wonderfully pointed out to me yesterday, uh, I said during the message that YouTube is not a great place to listen to preachers and learn about Jesus but you should go to YouTube and listen to me talk from last week. <laughs> and then you should listen to everything I say because I'm constant in my logic. Um, so what we talked about last week, we kind of laid a foundation. And what we talked about was this idea that if we're going to get healthy spiritually, like for good, we have to be aware that, that the primary issue with us being healthy spiritually is that as humans, we do whatever it is that we believe is true and so if what we believe is true is not actually true, according to God, it can wreck us spiritually. As, a, as an example of this, again, let's, let's flip it back to physical health. There was a really interesting thing that happened in the 1930s and the 1940s with cigarette advertising. In the 30s and 40s, the research hadn't been done yet on lung cancer and how much cigarettes and could, could really negatively impact your health. And there was a, uh, a, big, um, a big war amongst the cigarette companies to figure out which cigarettes were best for you. And Camel had a fairly famous ad that said, the majority of doctors smoke Camel cigarettes. That was their marketing tactic. Doctors smoke Camels, so you should too. Well, now, and listen, whether you smoke cigarettes or not is irrelevant to the conference. Like, now you know the risks. You're like, whatever, but that's fine. But if you would have believed that that meant they were good for you and then taken that action based on your belief in that truth, it would have had a significantly negative impact on your health, right? Similarly, if we believe things are true that are not true spiritually, and then we act on those because what we do is driven by what we believe is true, then we can end up in all kinds of spiritual unhealth and not really understand how or why it happened. I see this all the time with people. And so, um, so, so that's what we're looking at in this series. I laid that foundation last week. We talked about this truth versus lies thing. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a look, today in the next two weeks, we're gonna take a look at what I believe are the three biggest lies that Satan tries to get us to believe. The three biggest lies that he tries to get us to believe that if he can get us to believe them, we will then act on those lies and we will end up in all kinds of spiritual unhealth and confused and going, how did I even land here? All right? So the first lie, I want us to start, we're just gonna talk about the very first lie right now. The first lie that Satan tries to get us to believe is that if things were different, life would be better. If things were different, life would be better. This is huge. If things were different, life would be better. 
Now, as with any lie Satan tries to tell us, there's usually some element of truth within it that makes it very believable, right? The reality is that in a lot of ways, for some of us, like, if I had more money, life would be easier. I mean, it would be. There was a significant period of time uh, about two to three years ago where uh, Vanessa and I, we had had a car that had died, and we just didn't have the money to buy another car. So we survived with one car. Well, like, life would have been easier if we had a second car. That's it's true. The lie that we believe is that if things were different, life would be better. Now, what we're going to do as we kind of identify these lies is we're going to look to the Word of God to try to reframe that lie with what is true and how then that can change things for us. As you might have guessed today, we're going to look at contentment, right? So if things were different, life would be better. This is ultimately a question of contentment. If I could have more cookies, life would be better. That is true. <laughs> Just kidding. So we're going to look to the Word of God for this. Now, last week, we, uh, we looked at a couple different passages. One of the passages that we looked at was a portion of a letter uh, called Philippians, written by a guy named Paul to the church in Philippi. And as Paul writes this letter, uh, last week we looked at this section where he talks about how uh, whatever it is, uh, we should think about things that are true and right and noble and good. We should think about those things. And he identifies the fact that the war that we fight isn't a war in this world, but it's a war in our minds. That it's our thoughts that ultimately are the determiner of our health, which is why what we believe is true is so important. And so Paul, right before we're, the section we're about to read, we read last week, he talks about, think about the right kind of things. You need to focus on those things. You, you, need, to, you need to spend your time thinking about the right kind of things. That changes things. And immediately after he, he, uh, immediately after he writes that, he writes this in Philippians chapter 4. He writes, I, re I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you didn't have an opportunity to show it. And he says, I, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. That's an important phrase, I've learned to be content. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, again, he says, learned the secret of being content in any and in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And to finish the section... Paul writes what is probably one of the more famous verses in the Bible that is often taken totally out of context when he writes, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can do what? Well, if we rewind just a little bit again to kind of where we were last week, Paul's talking about how we should be rejoicing in all things. That's a, that's a tough thing to think about, rejoicing in all things. Most of us don't have that inside of us. Well, none of us have it inside of us by nature to rejoice in all things. He talks about rejoicing. Uh, he talks about being gentle with all people. He talks about, uh, he talks about getting to the point where fear uh, and anxiety don't control us. He talks about having peace. And then here he talks about being content. And he wraps it all with, I can do all that through him who gives me strength. I can do those things. I can rejoice all the time, no matter my circumstances. I can be gentle with all people no matter what they've done to me through him who gives me strength. I can have peace at all times through him who gives me strength. I can be content in all things at all times through him who gives me strength. That sounds nice. <laughs> that, sound, that sounds nice. The question is, how do we... How do we get there? Well, Paul gives us a, an important clue here. I mentioned a moment ago that that phrase, I've learned to be content, is really significant, right? The reason it's significant is because I think for some of us, we think about contentment like it's a gift that's given to us and we have it or we don't, but it's not. Contentment isn't a gift. And if you look at lists of spiritual gifts in the scriptures, you won't find contentment there. Rather, contentment is a skill that we learn. It's a skill that we can develop. It's a skill that we can be taught like any other skill. And so if contentment is something that you really struggle with, with like truly being at peace where you are, with not looking to externals 
to provide you meaning and satisfaction, but like truly just being like, I'm good. If you struggle with that, the good news is it's a skill that can be learned. It's not that you didn't get some gift and you're just doomed. And if it's a skill, then, then how do we gain it? There's a principle that's woven throughout the scriptures. One of the things that I, that I just think is so incredible about the Bible is that there are these patterns and these themes that are woven like deep into the fabric of it. That from writer to writer, from book to book, for generations, for thousands of years as the Bible was written, these themes remain constant. And this theme, this idea of contentment is one of them. Now, it's not always phrased as contentment. But the reality is that from the very beginning of the scriptures to the very end, we see how humans wrestle with wanting what we don't have and trying to desperately grab for control of it. You think about the very first story in the Bible of, of humanity falling. What happens? Satan tempts Eve with something she doesn't have that he knows she wants. Well, if she was content, she would have been good where she was, right? That's what contentment is. So he tempts her with something that she doesn't have, but she wants. And then all throughout the Bible, we see the same thing over and over and over. We have this appetite for more, for more, for more, for different, for different, for different, because we think the grass is greener on the other side, only to find that when we get there, there's another fence and more green grass and more and more, and it never ends. So how do we fight that? A couple of books earlier, a couple of, of letters earlier in Paul's life, he writes to the church in Rome. And when he does, he, he writes this in Romans chapter 8. And this starts to, to, to dial us in on what the truth is. He says, and we know, we know, we, we know, we have confidence that in all things. If you're a note taker, I want you to circle that. All things. In all things. Not some things. Not a few things, not most things. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Growing up, my parents had, um, I think it's still there actually, but they had like a piece of, I don't know, wall art, some decoration next to the fireplace that had this verse on it. I read it, man, I don't even know how many times over the years. This has become an anchor for me. It became an anchor for me early in my life. They didn't put it up there so it would be an anchor for, I don't know. I, I don't know why they put it up. Probably shouldn't say that. Mom, why'd you put that up? But for, for whatever reason, reading that over and over and over, that, that um, the truth of that sunk its way deep into my soul. And it has anchored me through some really hard things. For we know that in all things, in all things, things. The lie, the lie is that things would be better. If they were, life would be better if things were different. The truth is that God is working always, always. And as I think about this, we know that in all things God works for the good. I'm reminded of a story really early in the Bible. I said this is a theme woven throughout. I think of a story from the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. And Genesis is an incredible book because it just has all these really neat stories. But one of them stands out to me in thinking about this theme. That's the story of Joseph. Now, if you don't know the story, Joseph was a young man who was the, he was the youngest of 12 brothers, um, and he was his dad's favorite. If you're not a parent yet, uh, and you plan on being one one day, you might think, well, that's really mean of him to have a favorite. If you have kids one day, you will find out you have a favorite. That's a real thing. <laughs> that favorite shifts over time and in different seasons, but like, you, get, you know. <laughs> and you wouldn't admit it to very many people, so I'll admit it for all of us standing up here. <laughs> At certain points in time, you've got a favorite, and you know darn well who it is. <laughs> and you don't tell your kids, but you're like, I like that one the most. The other ones, I can take them or leave them right now, but I like that one a lot. Joseph's the favorite. The problem is that Joseph's dad isn't quiet about it. He's, uh, he's pretty bold about it. And so there's all these brothers and, and, and Joseph's the favorite and, and Jacob makes a big deal of it. And eventually Jacob buys him this really ornate coat or like overcoat. 
it's all these different colors and it's fancy and all the other brothers are like, of course he gets the baby, the coat, you know? Why not us? Why, I'm, I'm the oldest, why not me? It's always the baby. They always get the best things. And then to make matters worse, Joseph gets pretty arrogant about it and he starts bragging to his brothers and telling them things that, like if, you, if you're younger, Joseph, listen, if you're a youngest, Joseph's story is like a case study on how to not act. Just read it and then don't do all the things he did. So Joseph eventually makes his brothers uh, really, really angry. And, and, and Jacob sends the brothers off to, to, to tend the flocks and to have them graze in some distant fields. But he has Joseph stay home, which again, I can only like, I can, I can imagine what the older, or you know, what the brothers are saying at home. So he's the baby, he doesn't have to do any work. So Joseph's home with Jacob. All the other brothers are out shepherding. Eventually, Jacob wants to know what's going on. So he goes, hey, Joseph, go check on your brothers and bring me a report. That's a case study on what to not do as a parent. Don't send your kids to tattle on their brothers and sisters. Bad choice. So Joseph goes, and he's a good, obedient son, and he's going, and as he's a long way off, his brothers see him because he's wearing the fancy coat that his his dad bought him. They see him coming, and they devise a plan. Like, we're going to kill him. We're sick of this guy. We're going to kill him. One of the brothers speaks up and he's like, we can't kill him. We can't do that, he's our brother. So they go, all right, plan B, better plan. We'll throw him in a pit, leave him there. I guess it's a better plan. Well, they get him, they throw him in the pit and now they've got a problem on their hands. I like to think about these stories like, sometimes we read Bible stories and it's like, we, we, we disassociate with the fact that these were real people. Like, put yourself in that camp. There's 11 guys sitting around and there's like a pit, a well, Joseph's yelling from the well. I'm confident he's yelling from the well because he's in a well. Think <laughs> his brother's like, oh. so anyway, they come up, they're like, oh, we gotta kill him. No, we're not gonna kill him. We gotta kill him. No, we're not gonna kill him. Eventually they're like, oh, we know what we can do. We can sell him to slave traders. So they do. Some slave traders come by and they sell their brother, their youngest brother, into slavery. They take his coat and they take it home and they cover it in blood and They say to their father, Joseph was attacked by a wild animal. He's dead. His father's distraught. Not knowing that Joseph is now traveling on a trade route. Eventually, Joseph lands in Egypt where he's bought by a man named Potiphar. And in Potiphar's house, Joseph uh, makes a name for himself. Joseph works really, really hard for Potiphar and he's, he shows himself to be trustworthy and eventually Joseph works himself up to being second in command of all of Potiphar's affairs. And this is a big deal because Potiphar is a big deal in Egypt. And so Joseph has, has done some good things, like some really good things. He's been faithful to God. And in the midst of it, another really bad thing happens. One day Potiphar goes to work and Joseph is home with, with Potiphar's wife and Potiphar's wife decides she wants Joseph. So she tries to have him and he rejects her advances and he runs out of the house. But as he does, she grabs his coat and pulls it off of him and thinking, I'm gonna get revenge on this guy for telling me no. When Potiphar comes home, she lies and says, Joseph made advances on me. Look, I got his coat. And Potiphar furious throws Joseph in prison for something he didn't do, for doing the right thing. And I would imagine at this moment in Joseph's life, as probably was the case at several others, that Joseph was going, hey, life would be better if things were different. This is terrible. And I've done all the right, like I haven't even done anything wrong. Okay, I was kind of a jerk to my brothers, but like, I wasn't wrong about anything. I really was dad's favorite. I haven't done anything wrong. And here I am in Egypt. I was sold into slavery by my brothers, but I did the right things, and now here I am in prison. Eventually, Joseph meets a couple guys in prison who have some dreams, and Joseph's been given the ability to interpret dreams, so he interprets the dreams for them. And they're like, man, this is amazing. And Joseph's like, hey, real quick, hey, will you just, at whatever point you get out, will you remember me and tell somebody? Like, yeah, we will, we will. Eventually, they get out of prison, and they forget about Joseph. Until a little while later, the Pharaoh of Egypt has some dreams. And he's just distraught by the dreams. He doesn't know what sense to make of them. And at that point, the one goes, oh yeah, I know a guy. Pharaoh says, where is he? Jail, safe. So they go and they get Joseph and they bring him before Pharaoh, who at this point is one of the most powerful rulers on earth. 
Pharaoh tells him the dream. He says, I've heard you have the ability to interpret dreams. Joseph says, after all this time, Joseph says, well, it's not I who have the ability. It's God who gives it to me. But yeah, I can do it. So he tells him the dream. Joseph interprets the dream for him. And, and it's a prophetic dream. It's a dream in which Joseph realizes, hey, there's gonna be a famine. And because there's gonna be a famine, we've gotta prepare for it now. If we don't, we'll get caught in the midst of it. And so Pharaoh goes, all right. And, and they begin to prepare. And eventually, again, Joseph just proves himself trustworthy. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of all the preparations for the famine. And they gather grain and they gather grain and they gather and gather and gather. Meanwhile, all the surrounding nations aren't. Well, the famine hits. And when it does, Egypt is the only nation that has food. Everyone else has none. As a result of that, all of the surrounding nations begin to come to, to Egypt to barter and to trade because Egypt has a huge surplus. And who do you imagine Pharaoh put in charge of all of the operations? Joseph. Sold into slavery, accused of a crime he didn't commit, put into prison. And now he's risen to one of the highest ranks in the nation of Egypt. He's overseeing their entire operation with all this food. And as people from neighboring countries come and they, 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 they meet with somebody to negotiate a fair trade, they meet with Joseph. And eventually it's Joseph's brothers who show up at the foot of Joseph's throne. They don't recognize him because, I mean, they weren't expecting that their brother was going to be royalty in Egypt at this point. But Joseph recognizes them. And to make a kind of long story short, after a couple trips back and forth and a practical joke sort of that Joseph plays and some different things, he tests their character a little bit to see if they're still the same guys that sold him into slavery. And they prove themselves, they, they prove to Joseph that they've changed, that they've realized the mistake they made. And it's in that moment that Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and says, guys, it's me, it's Joseph. And, and his brothers freak out. Because they realize in this moment, this young man that they sold into slavery now has the ability to end them, just like that, with no one the wiser. And so terrified, they look at Joseph and they beg for mercy. And then we find in Genesis chapter 50, what I think is one of the most powerful lines in all of the Bible. Joseph says to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You wanted to do a terrible thing and you did a terrible thing, but God was working. Now look, I don't know whether or not God caused the brothers to do this or whether he just allowed it. That's way above my pay grade. When bad things happen, I don't know if God causes it. At a minimum, he allows it. Let's just land there. One day, I've got a lot of questions for God. That'd be one of them. I don't know if he caused it. I don't know if he allowed it. But it happened. What I know is that in the midst of it, he was working for good. Because that's what he does. It's what he has always done. And it's what he will always do. Just as Paul wrote in Romans, for we know that in all things you work for the good. He's echoing the truth that Joseph identifies here. When other people do things that they intend for harm, God is working and he is active and he will bring good in us from it, always. When circumstances happen that are terrible, this is like the ultimate, why do bad things happen to good people? That's the wrong question. It is the wrong question entirely. The right question is what is God doing in the midst of it? In my own life, as I look back and I look at the worst moments of my life, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've never really walked away from God. I've never, I just, he's been everything to me for my whole life. And as I look back at the moments in time, the periods where I'm like, God, what, God, what are you doing? Why is this happening? Why, I've given my life to you. I've done everything. I've oriented my whole being around you for my whole life. And this is happening? Why? When I look at those things in the rear view, I can, see, I can see that at every one of those moments, God changed me in fundamental ways that I don't know he could have without the circumstances. I'm a better man today. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better pastor. For 
all of those moments in time where it felt like God had abandoned me. Because he was working for my good when I couldn't see it. He was changing me fundamentally. And I couldn't see it. All I could see was the circumstances that I hated, that I thought were unfair, that I thought were unjust. But I couldn't see my king working in the background. And now I can. I wouldn't wish some of the things I've been on to my worst enemy. I didn't say that right. I wouldn't wish some of the things I've been through on my worst enemy. But I wouldn't change them. Not one thing. Because my God has faithfully led me through. He has worked in my life. And he has changed me in ways that I can't claim. That's what Joseph knew. When people intend to harm us, when things intend to harm us, when circumstances are bad, God is good. The lie is that if things were different, life would be better. The truth that we must replace that lie with is that when things are bad, God is working for my good. When things are bad, God is working for my good. Not will, not might, is, period, without fail. If you walk with Jesus long enough, this truth will make its way into the depth of your soul because you'll be able to look back at your own life and your own story and be like, he's never failed. I never once. I've failed a lot. He never has. The lie is that if things were different, life would be better. The truth is when things are bad, God is working for my good. There's one more, uh, one more verse that I wanna read today. It's a verse that sort of takes last week and this week and blends them a bit. It's from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah writes, you will, meaning God, you will keep in perfect peace. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. Those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in me. Last week, I told you that the war we fight, it's not a war in this world, it's in our minds, it's in our thoughts. Because Satan lies to us and he tries to get us to think wrong and when we think wrong, we do wrong. Isaiah says it again here, you will keep in perfect peace. He doesn't say you will keep content, but I really like that image of perfect peace as a picture of contentment. I have perfect peace, I have unfailing peace. I have a settledness, a calm, an unwavering. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast. When you hear the lie in your mind, things would be better. Life would be better if things were different. Your mind must be steadfast. You must speak truth to that lie and remind it God is working for my good. And my God will never fail. When circumstances in your life are out of control, and when they're unfair, and when they're unjust, and when you don't know what sense to make of it, you don't tell those circumstances, well, it's gonna work out one day. I don't know if it's gonna work out how you want or not, but I know that whether it does or not, God's still gonna work for your good. And so you tell those thoughts and you tell those circumstances, my God is working and my God never fails. The people that I know who have walked through unimaginable difficulty and come out with their faith strong on the back end, this is what they have done. They have told the lies of the enemy. Whatever happens, my mind and my heart are steadfast. My God never fails, and he is working for my good. I will trust it. That, by the way, is Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. See, contentment is bigger than possessions. We think about it in terms of money and stuff like that, but contentment is bigger than possessions. Contentment is a disposition of the entirety of me of the entirety. It, it, it's my disposition, all of me, toward God and my trust in him. 
To be content, I have to look for what God is doing in me in the circumstances and situations that I don't like. Often it's in those situations that God changes us the most. If I could give you one more practical, it would be this, that when you're in the midst of a situation where you find yourself asking, why God? Why is this happening? Why God? Why is this happening? And we ask that often, right? Why God? Why is this happening? I would, I would submit to you that that's the wrong question entirely. The truth is we may never have the answer to that question in this life. Whatever that circumstance is, whatever that thing is, whatever that relationship is, whatever it is, you might never get the answer to that question because God doesn't owe you an answer to that question. I think the right question is, God, what are you doing in me? Not God, why are you doing this? But God, what are you doing to me? What is it that you're trying to show me? What is it that you're trying to reveal to me? What is it that you're trying to do inside of me to make me different? I grew up here in Sunbury, and um, that, for those of you that have been around for a while, you've heard bits and pieces of this, maybe this exact thing, I don't know. But um, I grew up here in Sunbury. I went to Big Walnut High School, and I hated it. I hated it so much. Um, I just, I, I always felt like I was out of place. I never felt like, I, I never really felt like it was home um, I didn't feel like I belonged. I was bullied a lot through middle school in particular. Um, it's like middle school's the I don't even know why middle school exists. It should just go away. Um, but but I, I hated it. In fact, I hated it so much that um, by the time I got to, to high school, um, by the time I got to my senior year of high school, I pursued full-time post-secondary. In Ohio, you can do post-secondary. Some of you are familiar with that. You can take college classes as a part of your high school uh, experience. Um, I, I, I applied at Mount Vernon Nazarene University to do full-time post-secondary. They, they accepted 10 full-time uh, students a year. So as a high school senior, I lived on campus at Mount Vernon. I didn't go to one day of my senior year of high school. That's how bad I wanted out. <laughs> um, I hated it. There are specific people and specific moments, specific locations that I could walk you to right now and I could tell you who it was and what words they spoke to me. You know, people, people say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. It's an absolute lie. I can take you to the places and tell you the people and tell you the words they spoke over me that just messed with me. A few years back, my life fell apart, and um, nine years ago now, which is crazy, um, eight years ago. As it did, and as God began to heal me, um, and he called me home to start a church from the place that I never wanted to come back to in my whole life. I wanted to get as far away from here as I could. And he called me back here. And I was like, okay. And we got here and like, I was nervous. Like, man, I'm gonna run into some people that I don't like and how's that gonna go? And the funniest thing happened. I started to see some people around town that are those people that I could talk to and I could tell you the words they spoke. And my heart didn't have bitterness in it. And it didn't have anger. It didn't have a desire for vengeance. It didn't even have pain. It had peace. And it had love. Um, one of those kids, my son, one of those kids has a kid that's Mason's age. And Mason has invited him to birthday parties and things. And I just want him to know Jesus. I don't care what was done. And I tell you that story not to be like, well, look how much I changed. I tell you that story because I didn't do anything. I did nothing. I wasn't special or important. Other than when things got really, really bad, I said, God, what are you trying to do to me? And what God was trying to do to me was prove to me that I wasn't anything, that he was. And that I had been using my life too much trying to make a name for me instead of just trying to make a name for him. And as that began to change inside of me, I developed a love for people that I never had before. I developed a, a genuine care and compassion for people that I never had. I was able to let go of anger and let go of bitterness. And it was all because God took a terrible situation and did things inside me. Because that's what he does. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever you will face, God will use it for your good. Often in ways that you can't even begin to imagine but he will use it for your good if you'll trust 
what he's up to. I'll give you one more quick story on this um, for one more quick illustration. Uh, for Christmas, my kids got a Nintendo Switch. And um, Gavin, my youngest, who's four and a half, uh, has a, he has, he's a real problem. Um, he uh, apparently is with Nintendo Switch like I am with cookies. Uh, he just can't stop. He asks, uh, I would say roughly, he asks right now 12 to 15 times an hour, Daddy, can I play Koibi on the Nintendo? Daddy, can I play Koibi on the Nintendo? Daddy, can I play Koibi on the Nintendo? Daddy, I need to get a blueprint to upgrade my weapons. Daddy, can I play Koibi on the Nintendo? You may not, Gavin. <laughs> and if you keep asking, I'm going to take it away forever. When I tell him no, he sobs. Like, like legitimate, like not I'm acting up, like his heart is broken every time I say no. And Vanessa's like, well, how can you tell that face no? Like, easily, no. <laughs> in Gavin's mind, in Gavin's world, in Gavin's reality, when I tell him, no, you may not play Koibi, by the way, that's Kirby for those of you who are not familiar. When I tell him, you may, you may not play Koibi, all he can see is that I've just ruined everything good in his life. And in his little tiny world, there's nothing bigger than that. <laughs> I know that if I let my kid play video games every single time he wants to, um, I'm going to create some really unhealthy uh, realities in his life. And so I tell him no. And it's not because I don't love him. It's because I do. <laughs> he can't understand that because he just wants to play Koibi. When bad things happen in our lives, whether God causes or allows, I have no but God has perspective we don't have. God sees paths we don't see. God sees the directions we are headed that we can't understand. And he helps us get on the right road. And it's a silly example. But the way that I see where Gavin's headed is the same way God can see where we're headed. We just don't think that other people have that kind of perspective that we don't have. And in those moments, the question is, do you trust? Do you trust the one who formed you the one who breathed life into you, the one who has never failed you, and the one who never will? Or do you trust your understanding of your reality? Now to end, there's four uh, blanks on the bottom of your, of your notes. Um, last week I talked about how uh, in every one of these messages we were gonna talk about these four, uh, these four application points. If, you were, if you've made a New Year's resolution to get healthy, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to work out once a week. Well, that's not a great health plan, right? It might be better than, than nothing, but it's not a great health plan. If you really want to get healthy in your life, usually it's some combination of things that help you get healthy, right? So you're gonna, I'm going to eat right, I'm going to get rest, I'm going to work out, I'm going to do these things. I don't do any of those things, so it's not one of my resolutions. It never will be, but um, it's a variety of things, right? There's a holistic plan. As we were preparing for this series, I, I like to be very applicable, and I was thinking about it like, I don't want to give people like one thing to do, because I don't think that's a holistic plan. And so every week in the series, we're going to talk about these four specific things that you can do, that you need to do to get healthy spiritually. The first is that you have, you have, you have to trust God, or I'm sorry, good grief, put God first. My cheat sheet in the back wasn't up yet. You have to put God first. You have to put God first. That's the only starting point to spiritual health. We talked about this last week. If you want contentment in your life, if you want contentment, you have to put God first. You have to. Because without God as your anchor, a whole bunch of other stuff will become your anchor. And when other stuff is your anchor, it's gonna fail you and you're always gonna be living in fear and wondering what's gonna fail me next. You need a rock and an anchor that will never fail you. It's God. It's the only one. You gotta put God first. The second thing you have to do is you have to pursue God's truth. You have to pursue God's truth. Again, this whole series is dealing with this idea that like what we do uh, is, is driven by what we believe is true. Today, we identified a lie and a truth. What's great that I'm giving you a biblical truth, but now you're gonna have to wait till next week to get another biblical truth from me. 
If you are not actively pursuing God's truth in your life, you are dramatically limiting your ability to fight for your spiritual health. Because Satan's always whispering lies. He's not like, well, Sunday at 1030, I guess it's time to start lying again. It's constant. It's always. And if you aren't growing in God's truth, understanding it better on a consistent basis, you're going to fall behind and you're going to have a harder time fighting. This is going to look like things like learning to read the scriptures. that You can. Everybody can. They're not inaccessible. It's going to look like things like uh, developing your prayer life, like learning to really talk to God in a healthy way. By the way, that's why we talked about the uh, seven days of prayer thing Karina did in the, in the video. That's why we do seven days, what used to be 21 days. That's why we do it. It's not to have a week where we're like, hey, we did a prayer week. It's because I care very deeply about helping people learn how to pray, learn how to talk to God in a really healthy way because it's not, it's not rocket science. Anybody can do it. And so like that week, the whole goal of that week is for you to take some steps in your prayer life, in your communication with God, so that you can pursue his truth. The third thing you have to do is prioritize the right voices. Again, if you're a parent, man, you know that one of the biggest things that you care about is who your kid's friends are, right? Why? Because they impact them. Like, <laughs> we use the phrase here a lot, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. I just, man, it's so true. If you have the wrong voices in your life, they're gonna, they're gonna reiterate lies to you over and over and over. They probably don't even know they're doing it because they think that it's truth. But if you've got somebody that's whispering in your ear all the time, like, man, if you just had that thing, oh, you need 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 that thing, oh, wouldn't life be great with this? Oh, you need to go like, listen, your boss is being totally unfair. You need to go in and tell him you deserve a promotion. And if you don't get that promotion, you need to threaten to leave. And you're not gonna have contentment with that. I mean, you're just not. You need people to remind you of what is true when what you're thinking are a bunch of lies. You gotta prioritize the right voices. So get the right friends in your life. Um, I forgot to mention this last week and thank goodness a couple people talked to me afterwards and they reminded me of it. Sometimes, sometimes the right voices are counselors and therapists. Sometimes. People come to me a lot and want to talk about things and like, I can give you spiritual guidance, but like, if you're having some mental health stuff, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know how to deal with that. Sometimes counseling and therapy is listening to the right voices. This is part of why being a part of a church family matters. Like you need a pastor and some spiritual leaders who genuinely love you and who will speak truth to you and who you know them and you trust them. This is where I said last week, don't listen to people on YouTube. Because you don't know them and they don't know you. You don't know if you can trust their character. They might be slime balls and you have no idea. You need the right voices. You gotta give weight to the right voices. And last, you gotta participate in healthy community. Your community is your safety net. When things are falling apart, when things are very hectic, you need some people around you who love you and who know you enough to be like, hey, are you okay? and who you can be honest with so you're not trying to walk this road alone. If you wanna be healthy spiritually, you've gotta do those four things. You've gotta put God first, pursue his truth, prioritize the right voices, and participate in healthy community. Now, you can do one of them, and you'll get healthier. You could do two of them, and it'll help. But again, similar to getting healthy physically, if you do the whole shebang, <laughs> you'll be able to get a lot healthier a lot faster. If you want contentment in your life, you've got to do those things. Because if you put God first, he will begin to show you his truth. And then if you begin to pursue that truth on top of what he's showing you, you'll learn truth even faster and even faster. And then when Satan's lying to you, you'll be able to remember things like, for I know, I know that in all things God is working for my good. And then as you remind yourself of that and you have the right voices in your life, they're going to remind you of it too when you're weak. And if you're a part of a community, you're going to have people to walk with you when you don't feel like you can walk anymore. And if you do those things, you will get healthier. And you will start to find contentment. And you'll be able to stop eating the stupid chocolate chip cookies. I need to 
put God first, apparently, and pursue his truth and prioritize the right voices and participate in a healthy, non-cookie eating community. That's what I've learned today. My genuine hope, um, you know, whether I know you well or I know you just a tiny bit, my genuine hope is that this year would be a year where you're able to look back and you're able to go, man, things totally changed with God. I, I, like my faith grew deep. I, I, I grew roots that hold me firmer than I knew I could be held before. I told you earlier that I spent my life pursuing Jesus and um, what I can tell you is that after 30, 30, let's say 32 years, I asked Jesus in my heart when I was five, say 32 years. After 32 years of doing the best that I know to pursue Jesus, I am confident that there is nothing that can shake me. And that's not because I'm special. It's because my God is really faithful and really good. And he has never failed me. And I have an anchor that I know will never fail. And so my identity is there. My hope is there. My contentment is there because it never moves. And I want that for every one of you, no matter where you are in your walk. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your word that gives us instruction and these, le these beautiful letters written by, by Paul and these incredible stories that are written through the ages of, of your people and the ways that we have pursued you and the ways that, that we've just been real people. For stories like Joseph, where we can uh, look at the injustice he went through and yet we can see the faith that he had in the end. And, and thank you that we can look to those stories, not as, as, as people that we can put on pedestals and go, oh, they were perfect. But Father, thank you more that we can look at those stories and go, Man, that, that's, that's a model, that's, a, that's an image, it's a picture of what I need to be pursuing. And so, Father, for all of us today, for every one of us that's here, I ask that you would, um, that you would help the truth that when things are bad, you are working for our good. Father, I ask that you would help that truth to sink deep into our souls and that it would be like an anchor firm and secure, that when all of the stuff in life is throwing us around and is beating us up, Father, that we would be able to hold to the truth that you are constant, that you never fail, and that as we come out on the other side, we'll be able to see the good you have brought. And so, Father, in this moment, for the people in this room who are in the middle of a storm right now, I pray your peace on us. I pray your hope on us. I pray your comfort and your contentment on us. And Father, for those who are here and are not in the middle of something right now, but maybe know somebody who is, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and that you would give us um, courage to walk alongside so that nobody's walking through a storm alone. Father, for those of us who are here right now and we aren't going through anything at all, I pray that you would help us not to gloss over this truth because if we're not in a storm now, we will be one day. Help us to set an anchor in you that will never fail. It's in your name we pray today, amen.